Bob Green. Bob is a multi-generation land surveyor with over, over 42 years of experience in boundary, cadastral, right-of-way, topographic, and geodetic experience. He is a former business owner of Colorado-based land surveying and consulting firm. Mr. Green is the past two-term member of the monitor panel of the Colorado State Board of Licensure for Architects, Professional Engineers, and Land Surveyors, and a past two-term member of the Surveying Engineering Industrial Advisory Committee at New Mexico State University. Let me let somebody in. Bob was an integral part of helping to restructure the program to a geomatics uh, curriculum. Bob has been positioning has been a positioning consultant for numerous government agencies and private sector companies. Bob is currently employed by Frontier Precision Incorporated and is a well-known public speaker and measurement technology advocate. So without further ado, Mr. Bob, I appreciate it. And then uh, I think he said Troy was going to kind of tag team with him. So we appreciate both of your guys' time, but thank you, sir. All righty. <clears throat> Can you all hear me, I guess? Um, you are good to go. So, so I, I called this presentation um, GNSS modernization. Um, you know, I used to just focus on GPS modernization because it was the only valid entity up in space. And um, I call it new signals in space because it's, it's, it's almost hourly that things are changing and revisited because we have to continually revisit what's happening um, um, up in space. I can remember giving this lecture and I actually, it was called New Signals in Space about seven, eight years ago. And, um, and uh, Trimble, uh, the manufacturer that I helped represent had just adopted uh, the GLONASS interface and um, my GLONASS testing was not all that stellar at the time. And I referred to um, GLONASS satellites as Russian trash cans in space. And uh, because they bragged they could launch three at a time, hoping one would stay up. And um, um, uh, I was told by some of the Trimble colleagues there to go forth, be fruitful and multiply, but not exactly in those terms. Um, unlike other shiny shoe type salespeople, I actually go out and test the equipment. And so um, kind of what we're gonna be breezing through here is going through the main uh, constellations, kind of what their status is, um, and then looking at them from a perspective of what they broadcast and the value they bring. But not only that, but the status of where they are at, because not everything is complete. Uh, some things are, are, are um, a beta. So we're gonna kind of plow through that is, um, as quickly as I can. I'm not gonna focus on a bunch of detail, just kind of overview information. Um, some I might get a little high end just to kind of give you something to say, hmm, maybe I'd like to investigate that a little bit. So um, we are gonna be focusing on GPS um, and everybody knows what that is. Um, GLONASS, so the Global Orbiting Navigation Satellite System from the country of Russia. European Galileo, um, Chinese Bidu, uh, focusing on Bidu 3, and that'll make sense uh, once I get to it. Um, we're really not going to hit on quasi Zenith um, satellite system. Um, that's over the country of uh, Japan and down into Australia. And it kind of looks like it's a figure eight, but it almost looks like a, um, a bowling pin, you know, and it's got this a small top and then a bigger bottom. And uh, um, uh, so there's really not much going on there. I think they got four or five active um, right now. Their goal is seven, um, but it really doesn't totally affect us. Although I was in the Pacific Northwest and we picked up one, uh, which is kind of scary. I, you know, when you only have one from a constellation. So my gut tells me I just turn it off. Um, the same thing with the Indian Regional Navigation Satellite System. That's pretty much um, a geo uh, stationary over the country of India and surrounding countries. So it does engulf um, um, a pretty large area, but again, really doesn't affect us here in the United States, at least um, not substantially. Um, so on the GPS side, 
week currently, and it's been toggling between 29 and 30. Uh, we currently have 30 operational satellites up in space. Um, one thing that was ongoing back four or five years ago was this, what was called semi-codeless, codeless support, which basically meant if you didn't have a minimum of L2C on your receiver, it would be a doorstop. Um, so like an old, if you're a Trimble user, like a 5800 or a 5700, um, but that kind of hasn't, it hasn't gone all the way through. And I don't know, you know, a lot of our money got sent overseas to the war. And um, I had, the last I had heard, um, it, it had been delayed, but I do have the website there where you can read more about it. But quite honestly, if you're still using a GPS only receiver that doesn't have a minimum of L2C, um, that's pretty antiquated. Uh, but there is going to get to a point, um, uh, possibly, where those older units are not going to work. Um, GPS 3 or Block 3, we're going to talk substantially about that because that is the future of uh, GPS. Um, we first started tracking the first um, GPS 3. Uh, Block 3 satellite on January 13th of uh, 2020. Um, ten of these were developed by Lockheed Martin out of Waterton Canyon, um, outside of Littleton, Colorado. Um, so they are already developed, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, we did, right currently now, there are, are, are four up in space. Um, we launched number five. Um, so it's up there, but not in the constellation. Um, and so that was launched on uh, June 17th um, and then um, uh, formalized in the transfer, giving over to the, 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 uh, the, the uh, LA Air Force Base, basically. And I've been very fortunate. I visited uh, most of the ground-based telemetry stations in the United States so I've been to LA Air Force Base and done some consulting for them. It was kind of funny. I went there um, and I had never been. Um, all I knew is it was near LAX. And so I, I'm an older guy, 62 years old, and I get in a habit like I always stay in the same hotel every time I go to the same town. Well, I didn't know where to stay. So my secretary was looking it up and she goes, well, there's a Ramada not that far from, I probably shouldn't say the name of the hotel, but... Um, from where you were going. And, uh, and she said, um, won't we book you there? I said, okay. So I, I got checked into my room and um, uh, started to relax, get ready for the next day, sitting in bed. And all of a sudden I noticed my sheets moving and I found a mouse in my bed. Um, and I went down to the lady at the front desk and I said, I have a mouse in my bed. She goes, no, we don't have mice. I said, I got a mouse in my bed. You want to come see? And she says, well, maybe there's a mouse. Maybe there's a mouse. But anyways, um, so the fifth one is up there and it's been transferred and it's being um, operated on um, and uh, monitored by um, LA Air Force Base, which is, it's a small Air Force Base, by the way. Um, it's not very big. Um, <clears throat> future moving forward. Um, um, Lockheed Martin has also been awarded a contract for 22 of the Block 3F satellites for follow-on. These things are going to be rock stars because they've got technology on them. Well, the Block 3s themselves will be, um, um, once we get more than four, you know, we're going to have to have a really for full functionality, a full constellation of them. But that will make more sense here in a minute. So let's look at the current constellation that we have up there in space. So all of the block 2As are, are, um, um, have been uh, discontinued. They're up in the graveyard orbit. And I'll show you that here at the end of the presentation. Um, some of the block 2Rs, uh, seven of them, um, and they're still old school. OK, so there's no modernized signals on them. The R is for replenishment. So replenishment of basically the same block um, uh, two satellites. Then things really started to move with the two RMs. 
A matter of fact, manufacturers like Trimble took a gamble and put money into this technology, which then got delayed because of the Gulf Wars and stuff. And it, and it really um, didn't come to fruition until uh, much farther than what they had, had uh, thought previously. What is unique about the, uh, the two RMs is the L2C code. And um, I'll get into that a little bit more, but it's a biphase modulated code that has a lot more penetration power. So the C, L2C is for civilian. L2 was never meant for the private sector, is more of a, um, uh, for military applications. Um, and, uh, um, and anyways, debugging happened anyways. And long story, um, L2C is the first modernized signal. So. Uh, when I first heard about GPS was in 1978, um, and um, I had a eight-track tape player um, uh, uh, in a uh, 69 Camaro Super Sport, and uh, basically up until the Block 2 RMs, we still had eight-track tapes up in space, still broadcasting basically the same signals. Then um, the two Fs started launching. We have 12 of them operational. Um, they have all of the technology of the, um, the two RMs, with the difference being the tri-frequency of L5. And I'll go through that more too. More frequencies coming through the same ionosphere, the better we can model the ionosphere, longer baselines that we can measure. So that is a huge one right there. And then the threes and the three Fs, um, again, we have four operational, five up. Um, they have um, a, another killer signal on there, L1C. <clears throat> so again, for civilian. And L1C is much more robust than L1. Uh, so again, more penetration power uh, through canopy, just like L2C, more penetration power. Um, and along with L5. Um, and what's going to happen with these, um, and, and I'll talk about a little bit more, where, you know, I'm a big proponent of, uh, matter of fact, I just did a lecture, a keynote, where I, I, it was called Embracing the Past to Accelerate the Future of Measurement Technology, of looking back at what we've done, um, going back in time, and then taking that data and then incorporating it in a more modernized way. So L2C, basically, without getting into all the um, ins and outs, it is uh, broadcast on the same uh, frequency as um, L2. Um, and it, uh, it began launching in uh, 2005. Uh, there were predictions of 23 satellites by February of, of uh, 2022. The big thing here is the makeup of the signal. So it's biphase modulated. So simply put, um, there, it, it, there's two codes, CM and CL. CL is penetration, okay? CM carries the message data. So it's kind of like a line, CL is like the linebacker to get the message data through. So, you know, if you're in Canopy, um, L2C, um, enabling that if you have it on your receiver is a definite must because you're definitely getting um, um, better penetration. And that's, they call it here biphase shift key. It's biphase modulation, simply put, um, with those two codes, CM and CL, running simultaneously together, but getting that data over the same frequency. Keep in mind, same frequency, 1227.6, same as L2. But L2 was like a, a light bulb, like a little faint light bulb up in space. And that's why in, in the early days, why you had to pay so much for dual frequency. I mean, signal frequency was easy to get. That was L1, everybody could get that. But that L2 was more difficult to acquire and that becomes less of an issue, um, except on those block two R satellites, the R replenishment, RM replenishment modernized. And um, so those old legacy satellites don't have this infrastructure on it yet. 
So this basically goes through just what I said, um, um, but there is some weird things going on up in space. This L1C that I talked about um, um, is kind of spooky in a way. Um, you can see here on the, the, the picture, the yellow is traditional L1. So you can see it's noisy, right? There's even in a clean environment, L1 is noisy. Um, it's legacy, it's old, it's old technology. Then you can see this L1C, much more robust, much more clean, getting again, penetration um, in difficult environments. Um, some of the other benefits of the block threes, naturally they got the, the um, L1CA code, um, uh, the, um, um, the L1C, um, uh, the L2C that we already talked about, the L5, the tri-frequency, and the um, L1C. Now here's the kind of spooky part, is that all these constellations, Galileo, Bidu, um, um, the Indian IRNSS, and quasi-Zenith, all are broadcasting on the same frequency, the same data. So we have like a new world order happening up in space. But look who's not included in there. Um, there's no, there's no uh, 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 GLONASS. There's no cooperation with Russia of joining this new world order that I call it happening up in space. I mean, we're, we're, there's going to get to a day where there's going to be well over 50 satellites all broadcasting on the same frequency, the same wavelength, the same message data down to end users on the ground. Great for end users, but kind of scary. You know, we'd say, well, we're not getting along with uh, China. Well, hooey. I mean, we are already communicating with them up in space. Um, you know, I, I've been showing this slide here for about a year or so, and I've never seen anybody else show it. And then I go on while I'm, I was stuck at the airport this morning, which that's another story. Um, um, I hate when they tell you a delay, then another delay, and you really know at the end of the day when you see your baggage coming off the plane that it's going to be canceled. And that's what happened to me. I was canceled this morning. So, um, uh, but anyways, um, I hadn't seen anything, and I seen one similar that was posted, um, and this is um, um, a, a lunar laser ranging retro reflector that was left up on the moon. There's a series of them, um, and uh, um, they were left there. You can see they're not very big. Uh, you can see a footprint, um, so they're, they're about maybe 18 inches or so square. And what they do is they give us the ability to monitor the moon sub-centimeter. And what we've learned is that the moon is moving away from the Earth at about four centimeters per year. And so since we've been recording this, since the early Apollo missions, uh, the uh, moon has moved away from the Earth several meters. Now, in the, in, the, in, the, in the small picture, that doesn't mean anything. I mean, yes, the moon moves away from the Earth. It slows down the Earth's rotation, um, but it, it's gonna be over millions of years before we're really gonna see true impact and change of tide. But nonetheless, it's nice to see what's happening. But I didn't bring this up because the moon is moving away from the Earth, but these lunar laser ranging retro reflectors are going to start being installed on these block. Not many people know this, um, but they're going to be installed on these block three um, uh, satellites, not the current ones. They're starting at, I think, SV09 or, or um, uh, block 309, and then definitely on the follow on, the block three Fs. So we're going to be able to take measurements from the ground from these telemetry stations I'll show you, and we're going to know pretty damn close where that satellite truly is. And with intertype of communication, what's that going to do to us on the ground? It's going to beef up the integrity of the data that we can collect. Because uh, currently, we have to wait a little over, depending on where you are in the week, You know, somewhere two, two and a half weeks to get precise ephemeris data. 
I'm not saying that we're going to get precise ephemeris data real time, but it's going to be close. There's going to be, it's going to be somewhere in between rapid and I, I don't know yet, but it, it's going to be huge. And so we're taking that old science, we're taking what we did back in the 60s and 70s, we're refining it to modern technology, which is now going to be going on to satellite infrastructure. So the benefits here, <clears throat> naturally, um, the ionosphere. The ionosphere modeling is, is, is everything. The better we can model the ionosphere, the better we can measure on the ground with our GNSS equipment. And it's funny because <clears throat> the private sector, and I'm not here to tout Trimble, but they're a private sector company, actually are developing better ionospheric models and orbital parameters than the federal government because we use full GNSS, whereas the government tends to rely more on GPS within itself. So um, I've been doing some experiments with Trimble ionospheric models and instead of IGS or um, orbital um, SP3 type files getting uh, um, Trimble what they call CMRX data and then what I'm finding out is with better ionospheric modeling um, in the not 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 so much in the real time world but in the post processing world I'm, I can with less data I can have longer baselines is what it basically boils down to um, so. Um, um, again, the, um, the L1C um, and then the L5 at 1176.45, we've now got th three, you know, three of our own frequencies. That's not counting all of the other frequencies coming down from the other constellations. This is a ionospheric map, um, um, which is, is a map of TEC, what they call total electron content. And um, what it's showing basically is in the tropics, um, which by the way, it's kind of bizarre. You know, we, um, in my studies, you know, um, in 240 BC, Arathanes with a post in the ground, a hole in the ground, a calibrated camel, an hourglass, and some records from Alexander the Great determined the circumference of the earth within about 3% of accuracy. He also defined the tropics. If you know what the tropics are, you know the obliquity of the ecliptic. If you know the obliquity, then you know the earth's relationship to the sun in 240 BC. So that kind of ties in here because you can see that thread between the tropics of the higher electronic uh, or the um, total electron content. And um, I've actually, while watching football sometimes, I'll kind of watch this during the day. And it's pretty amazing um, what happens. And you, it's, it's free. You can get to it. The website's there at the bottom. Um, or you can just Google search Trimble Ionospheric Map and um, um, geek out someday if you want to. But it's pretty interesting. Um, so, you know, there's three segments of GPS. We've been talking about the space segment. Um, we are the user segment, and we have a, a, a big, I believe, a, a big something to say about the future of technology moving forward. Because if manufacturers develop equipment and you don't buy it, well, then they're going to go in a different direction. So the user segment's pretty powerful. Up in <clears throat> the top right, you can see we grew from our initial, I believe, six um, ground-based stations that were um, around the globe to now a total of 16, and that was completed in 2008. Um, we also went through an uh, OCX uh, operational update where the computerization was also updated. And what's cool here is that picture to the bottom right, that is an antenna. And, and they, I've been to, um, in, in the United States, I've been to uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base. That's the secondary master control station. I've been to LA. Um, I've been to Schriever in Buckley. Uh, Schriever is the master control. I've been to Cape Canaveral in Patrick Air Force Base. And when I was at Schriever, um, I was in the same bunker because these buildings don't have windows. And I was in the same bunker as the atomic clock. And I was told I was going to be able to see the clock. 
and I had all these security clearances, but I needed one more signature and it was a Friday. And in true government fashion, the guy that needed to sign off for me left early for the day. So yours truly did not get to see the clock, but I was in the same bunker as it. And, uh, and, my, and they encased these antennas in the sheathing and they call them golf balls because that's exactly what they look like. They, they sit up on this like golf tee that goes up, I don't know, um, maybe 200 feet up in the air. And then they have this sheathing so that our enemies can't see which way we're facing our dishes. Um, and so the locals on base call them um, golf balls. It's, it's, it's ironic because here I am doing positioning assignments on um, the, the space command segment for the United States Air Force. And um, my job wasn't so much to interface with the Air Force, although I did, but mainly to help position or reposition the, um, the antennas that powered the local GIS on base. And out of all of them that I went to, every single one of them was wrong. Um, one up to 70 feet. So can you imagine you're on the mother church of GNSS monitoring, GPS monitoring. Um, you're at the space command and all of a sudden your, your, your positioning is 70 feet off. It's just crazy, but it did happen and it's a true story. Um, uh, anyways, L5, <clears throat> L5 is um, more penetration power. Again, um, we get that tri-frequency, we can better model the ionosphere. Um, because of the, because of this, we can also start to measure longer baselines because we have better, again, the better we can model that ionosphere, you know, it, it used to be, um, uh, back in the day with L1 receivers, we had to rely upon Klobuchar, and Klobuchar is the, is the model that was encased in um, the, the, the uh, GPS signal, and it, it would take care of about on a good day, 60% of the RMS and noise components of the ionosphere. Um, but then once dual frequency receivers came out, we didn't have to do that. And then same thing is starting to happen with the troposphere. We don't need to, the, uh, the hop field tropospheric model anymore. We can do our own thing. We incorporate it, but that's a whole nother lecture within itself. But it, it, it's pretty cool technology having this tri-frequency. So on each one of these interfaces, I kind of wanted to show you how they interface with a receiver. Um, on the Trimble side, we have um, uh, infrastructure receivers that power like our VRS or um, 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 RTK uh, uh, nets. And we also have um, the R10, R12, or R10 to R12, R12i. They all have these web UIs and a lot of people surprisingly don't know that they exist and you can tap into them with your cell phone. Um, if you go to our website, we have on-demand training. Um, a lot of them are free and I've done some tailgate, we call them sessions, where I show you how you can start your base station with your cell phone, just through the web UI. And this kind of gives um, the tracking information of uh, everything going on with GPS. And you can see all the basic information there, the, uh, the elevation, the azimuth, uh, what we are tracking. So if, there's, if they're blank, we're not tracking them. Um, signal to noise ratios. And you know, it's kind of weird because <clears throat> I see that 21.9, that's kind of low. Usually anything kind of hitting that 20, uh, that 20-ish. 20, um, um, it's not as big of a deal today. We have so many signals. But back in the old days, if we had, you know, um, um, low signal to noise ratios, we, we kind of have a tendency to turn them off, mostly related to um, L2, um, not so much L1. But anyways, so we got our signal to noise ratios. And again, relating to what I just ta talked to you about, notice L1, I mean, um, well, L1 is all the CA uh, course acquisition or commercially available code, but look at our CM and CL, the biphase modulation. So this is telling you that those satellites that uh, that data is coming down from is either a block 2RM um, a, uh, a 2F or a block three. 
So, um, um, uh, or CM and CL wouldn't be there. And that's very important. The E that you see there kind of in the middle of the screen um, under L2, that's just legacy L2E. And then we got what's called IODs. And I'm not gonna go through all the gory details, but it's issue of data ephemeris, meaning it's like a timestamp of the ephemeris. But the user range accuracies are kind of interesting. Their estimated accuracies or range accuracies has nothing to do with your receiver. It's the data coming out of the, um, um, the, the satellite. And um, uh, at least the government specs URAs, or they sometimes call them UREs instead of accuracies, errors um, uh, of sub two meters. You can see these are all right at that threshold for some reason. Usually I see them a little bit lower. Um, and I understand the GPS language, the way that some of the other constellations interface with some of this data. I'm not 100% sure. <clears throat> I only, time is one thing I don't have a lot of. I travel a lot and I lecture a lot, but I am doing research for various things. So hopefully I'll have some, if I was to come back and do something again, I might have some different answers for you. Now we're gonna hop away from <clears throat> the GPS world and look at the GLONASS world. And it's owned by the Russian Aerospace Defense Forces or the Russian government. They currently have a total of 25 satellites in their constellation. Um, 22 are currently operational. Um, in 2011, they returned to a full 24 satellite constellation. So what happened was the Russian government, when I say Russian trash cans in space, I'm not joking. These things were, they couldn't keep them up. In some cases, they didn't even know where the heck they were, um, uh, but they were up there. And so President Putin or prime minister or whatever, he signed an agreement with the Indian prime minister Singh, I think is his name. And they started negotiating around 2007 and they got to a point around somewhere de December of 2010, where, where India was helping out. And that's when you started to see improvements in GLONASS because, um, you know, in the old days, you know, you'd read industry publications from academia um, and reading some of that's like going from the crack pipe to the tailpipe. It's like just craziness, some of the stuff I hear. But nonetheless, the, um, they, they used to say that they, the, GLONASS was complementary to GPS. It's hooey. It wasn't in the early, especially in the early days. Uh, we don't even orbit around the same center of the Earth. They're PZ90 or 90.2 or Prometri Zemli. We're WGS84. They have three orbital planes. We have uh, six orbital planes, blah, blah, blah. The list goes on and on. However, over time, they're starting to become more supplementary. So they were frequency division multiple access, meaning that each satellite was separated by a slightly different frequency. And they're coming full circle to be more like us and Galileo and uh, some of the others. And I'll go through that here in a little bit. They had a real devastating crash. <clears throat> um, they had a proton rocket uh, crash in 2013. Naturally, three satellites, right? They launch, we usually launch one. And you can see the, uh, the way the structure is there on, their, uh, on that backdrop that I have. Um, and they, they lost three satellites right off the bat. And 2016 was not a good year for GLONASS. And this is the scary thing and why people need to start being aware because in 2016, through portions of the year, they didn't even know where their satellites were, yet people were on the ground taking measurements from these satellites. And there's no Russian with a megaphone yelling, don't use me today. You know, it's, it's uh, so they did have um, bad ephemeris, meaning they didn't know where their satellites were. Um, and that strip, they struggled throughout that, uh, through 2016. And then um, eventually got it figured out. Um, they have, have gone through almost a mimic of what we did. So if you look there to the bottom kind of right, the GLONASS K2 uh, 2020 launching, what do you think they're similar to? They're, they're like our GPS threes. They have a lot of similarities. GLONASS um, um, uh, K satellites were like our block um, 2Fs. 
And then the M, notice the same M for modernized. They were more like our Block 2RM satellites, um, the replenishment modernized. And then the legacy ones, um, keep in mind those legacy satellites were frequency division multiple access. So not like us at all. Um, so if they had satellites broadcasting on the same frequency, they'd have to keep them like antipodal or antipolar, so on opposite sides of the globe, so you wouldn't pick them up. So it wasn't a good um, infrastructure at all. And again, they're, they're starting to come full circle. Um, so this is kind of putting their, um, trying to get this little bottom thing here so I can see. Okay. Um, so they got 25 up there, 22 are operational, two in a maintenance phase, and then um, one in a, a, a test phase. And it's been there for quite some time um, because I checked this morning. And so that's today's date. Uh, previously, the last time I had checked was in February, and it really hasn't changed. And then uh, off there to the right, you can kind of see the breakdown of the satellites, which ones are operational and, and what's going on with them. And, and you can also see that, um, that they don't have any spares up there right now. I think that might um, 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 change itself, but we'll see. Huh, why is my not? Huh. Okay, this shows, um, Control it shows oh. I, I've got, okay. So anyways, I had my voice on there from a previous talk. I don't know why it was there, but basically what that showed is the, um, the control segment for GLONASS is predominantly in the, um, uh, the former Soviet Union. Um, the scary thing is, is that they have um, um, five stations that they put in Brazil. They're working on a sixth and they've signed a contract for a seventh. So they they want more global domination of their um, their satellite constellation. It's pretty scary because here in uh, GPS World magazine, just back in February, um, uh, a CIA analyst, a well-known George Beebe, um, came out and, and, and informed everybody that they have what they um, term as ground-based satellite weaponry, or ASAT. So they've taken out some of their defunct satellites and blown them out of space. And so just, uh, just consider that there's been a threat that, he, that they're going to take out, or they could take out, um, um, uh, GPS satellites. Now, if they did, I'm sure that would start a big, huge war, but it's kind of funny. I, I read a lot about the Bible, and I don't refer to the Bible as a spiritual document, but a historic document. In Revelation 6.13, it says, and the stars fell from the heavens like unripened figs falling from a fig tree when shaken. So if you visualize that, a fig really doesn't look like a falling star, unripened fig, it would have to be shaken extremely hard. So theologians have said, well, that would be the end of times, would be a meteor shower. But over the past decade, they say, no, it's going to be space vehicles falling from the sky. And I used to laugh up until I seen this, and I'm going, oh, I don't know, no, no, maybe, maybe there's something to it. But uh, I hate to be a doom and gloomer, but anyways, they're... The bulk of their, um, their, their, their tracking is in the former Soviet Union and um, um, down, they're working very closely with the country of Brazil. Um, and again, they just recently, last month or two months ago, signed a contract to put in number seven down in Brazil. Um, and this is kind of what the, um, the GLONASS tracking looks like. Um, uh, on a web UI. Again, this is on a, um, a Trimble R2 that I had out in the field that particular day. You can see that I'm tracking, um, um, looks like six GLONASS satellites, uh, incorporating five of them. Um, and uh, all the basic stuff, signal to noise ratios, uh, the CA code, so their code structure is very similar to ours, signal to noise ratios, issue a data ephemeris, which is kind of, looks good because there's all of the same um, um, uh, ephemeris date. 
But look at the user range accuracies. We've got, remember when I said GPS is around two, they've got one up at seven. So what, I'm not saying don't use GLONASS when you're out in the field, because you don't really see this. It's kind of um, the modern receivers kind of suck it up in the background through like uh, originally H, uh, HD GNSS, and now we have ProPoint and other manufacturers have other similar things where we don't have RMS anymore, right? So if you have RMS, that means you're still relying upon a 19 centimeter wavelength on L1. So all that the other satellite constellations are doing are being supplementary to that L1 wavelength. And, you know, so the days where I used to tell people, well, keep your GNSS equipment away from chain link fence, because if the chain link fence, if you take the diameter of shoving a pipe through that, it's 19 centimeters. So a signal would come down, wrap through that chain link fence, distort the integer count up to the satellite. Uh, also ponderosa pine needles. If you live in ponderosa pine country, they're about 19 centimeters long. Well, we don't have to worry about that because everything is becoming more and more code based. And um, we're not relying upon that L1 as much as we used to, but still, um, and it's also showing us the type of satellite. All of these on that particular day were the M, their modernized satellite, so the equivalent of our Block 2RM um, satellites. We'll now get into Galileo. And um, Galileo owned by the European Union, um, and it's privately owned, so there really isn't a huge government involvement. Uh, it's under civil control. Um, they first started offering services in 2016. It was really slow to get off the ground. Um, it, they started off with these GEOV or uh, Galileo in orbit uh, validation element or experiment um, uh, satellites. They had an A and a B. And then there was talk about um, a, a fee based charge for some of their signals. And um, um, anyways, they've had a rough and rocky road, but uh, back uh, December 4th, of, depending on what time zone or time you're in the fourth or fifth of last year, um, what ended up happening is they launched their 27th and 28th satellite. So 30 um, uh, is full coverage. They originally planned on that for 2020. Naturally, it hasn't happened yet but they do have uh, 28 of their 30 um, up in space. Um, they're not all um, um, in the orbit right now. They have 28 in the orbit, 22 are usable, but check it out down at the bottom there. They have, e notice, very similar, E1, just like L1, E5, like L5, so on and so forth, but they're CDMA, Code Division Multiple Access, just like GPS. So we've got that in common. Um, and that helps us share that uh, L1C data that's common throughout all constellations with the exception of GLONASS. <clears throat> and RHCP, right-hand circular polar, meaning sinusoidal polar around a zero line. And when signals come in hidden obstruction, they turn left-hand circular polar. And in the uh, starting back in around the, the 58 or R8 one day, somewhere in there, we started to be able to recognize that left-hand circular coming in and throw it out of the solution, but we've come a long way since then. Um, they also went through a kind of a faulty launch period where they put a, um, um, a satellite in the wrong orbit, and it took about a year long what they term as an Einstein test to kind of correct it, and they eventually did. Um, this shows their orbital parameters in the thing I, I find interesting is, I, and I don't want to get into a big thing about, uh, you know, everybody knows that uh, Isaac Newton developed the formula for, for ellipsoidal flattening, which we all should be aware of, you know, which is A minus B divided by A, A the semi-major axis, B the semi-minor axis. And when we take B squared or uh, one minus B squared over A squared and take the square root, that's eccentricity. And eccentricity value is telling me that orbit is circular. And so um, uh, just kind of unique that there's no, but then you get down to their auxiliary slots and they do have a slight, um, a slight difference there. So I'm not sure what those, 
auxiliary slots are. When I get some free time, I'm going to investigate that. But I just kind of found that kind of unique um, um, and interesting. Um, and you can see their semi-major axes um, of their orbit and all that kind of good stuff that are on the orbital parameters. We have pretty good um, ground control coverage. Um, um, and, you know, they're not, they're not total global, but they're better than most. They're better than GLONASS, for instance. And ironically, the one in North America is in a little town called St. Pierre. And my mother's name, main name is St. Pierre, and they come from Quebec. And so once I told her this, that there's a town there. And the reason they put it there is because that there's a series of little islands that are owned by the country of France. So that's basically France, but in North America. And once I told my mother that my uncle, my mother's what, 83 and my uncle's in his late 70s. So they're on a mission, mission from God to figure out um, how our immigrants came over. And if St. Pierre is named after um, my, mother's, um, um, my mother's family. Um, and so here we can see the Galileo layout, very similar with the exception of, I mean, you still have the user range accuracies a little bit uh, higher than what we usually have. But the thing I want to point out is the different type of code structure. The BOC is for binary offset carrier, and the C is for composite. And um, um, basically, it's a multiplex modulation. So it's, it's an advancement, really, compared to what we have with um, um, GPS. It's kind of a different uh, structure. And ALT, and that should have, if you were to widen it out, BOC. And that is a variable constant modulating um, 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 signal as well. Um, and I don't want to go into all those details, but the ALT has more penetration power than the, the composite BOC. Does this sound familiar? It's kind of similar to like our L5 has more penetration power than L1. So even though Galileo isn't fully up and functional, it's still more or less beta until you see terms in industry magazines called FOC or final operating capability, um, then they will be up and going. And you can see the number that I was tracking that day. So pretty impressive um, on the um, Galileo side and their data is pretty clean. When I'm post-processing um, and doing static analysis and uh, PPK, I have a tendency to turn off GLONASS until two and a half weeks or so because they have um, also, they also publish um, um, updated orbits and that, that cleans up the noise. The RMS is a little bit high, um, but real time out in the field, it's not really an issue on the uh, GLONASS side. Um, last but not least, we're gonna look at Chinese Bidu. Um, Bidu is a um, uh, kind of a Chinese term for the big dipper. And um, um, it really, they went, they took it quite carefully um, they had three phases, BDU-1, which started in 2000. And if you see there to the upper right, they really were only looking at geostationary data over China. Um, and so once they accomplished that, and um, uh, around the, um, they started a phase two, which still people call compass, but it's not. I mean, well, it, it was then, but it, 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 people refer to it as compass. It's not, it's gone beyond compass. But that was uh, coverage of what you see there to the bottom right. And so they were starting to get more um, hemisphere um, coverage with the, uh, the compass or b 2 um, initiative. Um, and it was scheduled, um, well, then b 3 which they've been working on since. And um, um, ironically, they scheduled the Chinese meet their deadlines. They were scheduled to complete in 2020. And during the height of COVID, within a couple days of us stopping a launch of a Block 3 satellite, um, um, we stopped and they continued to launch. And they completed their constellation June 23rd of 2020 and have since issued FOC. So final operating capability it has been issued on um, um, 
Bidu or the Big Dipper. Um, they also have put in um, uh, 12 new ground stations. I couldn't find a really good map. It was kind of hodgepodge on where they're at. But again, um, any country usually concentrates their ground control at who owns it. So the bulk of our ground control is in the United States. Why? Because we own it. The bulk of Galileo, if you've seen that, was in the European Union. And so the bulk of the uh, ground control for uh, Chinese Bidu is in um, China. Hmm. Not sure what, there we go. Um, so they have a total of six orbital planes, um, uh, a total of 35 satellites. I think they have two spares up there now, uh, I believe, 37, but um, I have to double check. Uh, five are geostationary over the country of Japan for doing whatever they want to do with them. Uh, 27 are in medium Earth orbit. That's the ones we care about, or MEO. Um, so all of the constellations um, have satellites in the medium Earth orbit. That's where all of our data comes from. They also have three inclined geosynchronous um, um, satellites for particular applications of what I'm not 100% sure of. Um, again, they 55 degree inclination off of the equator, very similar to the way that many of the other constellations are set up in their um, medium Earth orbit um, are up at um, uh, uh, 21,500, we're at 20,200 with um, GPS, and then their high Earth orbit um, for their geostationary uh, are up over 38,000 kilometers. This kind of shows that tracking. Um, and the only thing here worth mentioning is you can kind of see off to the right, which you didn't see with the other constellations. You can see the MEO, the medium Earth. Those are the ones we're using. Um, and, um, and then the GEO, um, those are there. Notice we're not using them, um, uh, but they're there. And you can see the numbers go way into the 60s. And that's because they kept up a lot of their old satellites from BDU-1 and BDU-2. So they have a lot more up there um, when you combine all of their three efforts all together. So we have the geostationary and then the medium Earth orbit. And you can see on that particular data, I was what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven um, uh, BDU satellites that I was tracking. Keep in mind, it's not beta anymore. FOC has been published. So when you're making purchase decisions, keep that in mind that this is free data, right? You don't have to pay for it. Um, well, it's not free when you buy it from the manufacturer. I mean, they're going to charge you for it, but it is uh, FOC, unlike um, Gal uh, Galileo, which is still, um, 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 they're still launching. How does this impact the surveyor? Well, simply put, the more satellites that we have up in space, the more signals, better um, orbital and ionospheric parameters. Um, and you notice now that we used to be always um, a centimeter plus a part per million by two centimeters plus two parts per million, or then it went, you know, and all these um, antiquated um, thinking. We now, with um, some of this pro point um, technology, we're able to now get real time out in the field eight millimeters by 15 millimeters on the vertical side. So the, these slight improvements will continue and continue. Keep in mind, the key is those block threes that are gonna be launched with those retro reflector type technology on it. That's gonna be game changer technology. And, and if you play the stock market from what I've just told you, you may wanna do a little investigating because I tell you stuff is gonna go crazy out there once we have a full constellation of these type of satellites. Um, here, all I want to point out is you're only as strong as your weak link. If your base is a, a GPS in GLONASS um, and your rover is full GNSS, you're going to be looking at 34 satellites on your rover. You're going to get data come over from your base. You're going to drop down to 15 or whatever satellites. Same thing when you're working off of an RTN. Um, so you're only as strong as the weak link. Um, here's how we kind of show it in our software. Um, I was out in the field that day, 200s by 300s, and I was uh, logging, uh, uh, you can see the E for the Galileo, European Galileo, R for Russian GLONASS, 
um, and um, 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 uh, then naturally the the uh, the C, if I had C's on there, um, C for uh, Chinese Bidu and G for GPS, and the OS down there is actually it's OmniStar, so this probably isn't a uh, RTX enabled, but um, that would be our the equivalent of our RTX um, um, satellite. Um, um, up there in space that we were tracking, but not incorporating. Apparently there wasn't a subscription on this particular receiver. And that's awesome, awesome science. Um, and then we have uh, ways to um, enable these. Notice here, I just, for an example, uh, didn't check BDU, um, um, but you can. Uh, definitely L2C is a must. Uh, L5 is a must. Galileo, eh, questionable because Again, it's not full FOC, but still, if I was going into Canopy, I probably, um, I have got no negative answers because of Galileo not having 30 satellites up. And now that FOC has been completed, I probably enable BDU. Some of these elevation masks go back into the 90s. Um, you can play with them and, and uh, manipulate them. I mean, a PDOT mask of six is pretty antiquated, but that is still defaulted in our software. This just shows you the vast array of what's going on in space with all of the constellations. It's pretty amazing just to look at what's going on out there as we speak. Um, one thing I did want to touch on, um, I think is probably one of the more important things that I'm going to talk about to end with here, is, is what I call yokes or dead zones. So um, I survey a lot at about 39 degrees of latitude. And um, um, uh, 105 of longitude in southern Colorado. And you can see to the north, I have a yoke. I have no satellites. So if I'm going to block an obstruction, like if I have to measure a power pole, I'm going to block the north because there isn't any satellites there anyways, right? But that's not the case all over the globe. So as you see here, if I get up and I took um, an Alaska position, that that yoke becomes more overhead, right? So the farther you go north, that yoke or dead zone, because everything is inclined or the planes, the orbital planes are inclined from the equator um, um, are affected. So we have that no zone um, at 75 degrees. Um, and what is that gonna do for you? Well, it's gonna change your PDOP, especially your VDOP, um, because you know, for good VDOP, we always wanted at least a couple of satellites above an elevation of about 60 degrees or so. And so that may become difficult the farther north that you go, but then you go on the equator and we got pretty much full coverage because that's where all of the, um, the orbital planes are built from. So if you want a reason to go to the Bahamas, just tell your wife, there's no yoke there. I can go and I can have full GNSS coverage while you're bathing in the sun. I can get full GNSS while I'm in the Bahamas or there between the tropics. This here kind of shows a little bit of what I'm talking about putting everything together. Um, you can see all of the satellite constellations, uh, BDU, GLONASS, Galileo, GPS, all in their medium Earth orbit. Um, keep in mind, they're on different orbital parameters. So we orbit, again, our orbit is Keplerian in nature for the most part. Um, uh, GLONASS is Earth-centered, Earth-fixed, position and velocity-based. Um, uh, 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 Galileo orbits around the Galileo terrestrial reference frame, Chinese B, uh, Bidu around the Chinese terrestrial reference frame, and all different things going on up in space. But nonetheless, they're all in that. And you can see where the, um, if I just spin that one more time, where the, uh, the geostationary orbit is um, uh, way up there in space. And then just above that, is the graveyard orbit. So where we send satellites to die. So once the satellite is dead, we put it in the graveyard orbit, put it into Keplerian uh, um, uh, 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 parameters and just let it go. So as we start to try to get to Mars and do all these things, we're gonna have all the space trash up there that we're gonna have to be um, aware of. You can also see the relationship of how close into Earth the ISS or the International Space Station is, Hubble and the Iridium, um, that those are the um, cellular 
communication satellites for like cell phones and that type of thing. So they're all very um, uh, close to the earth, unlike our uh, medium earth satellites. Whoops. And kind of ending here, um, I wrote an article back when I, I went through two brain surgeries uh, last year. Um, and so while I was down and recuperating, I wrote this article for American Surveyor Magazine, our satellite-based correction services, the next utility, all about SBAS and Trimble RTX and the future of what I truly, truly believe is the future of our profession, or not so much the profession, of the measurement science. Just imagine, you can right now go to any part of the United States, hop out of your truck and go to work within a couple of minutes and be on the same coordinate system every single time. No opus, no, um, none of that. It's, um, it, it was sporadic, but now it's total, uh, total coverage. So give it a look if you go to American Surveyor Magazine's uh, webpage, um, americerve.com. It's under archive in the Bowman it has Bowman on the cover, and my article is in there if you wish to read it. And if I'm asked to come back in the future, maybe it's a topic that we could cover um, because I truly, truly, I'm, I'm so passionate about it. I, I just, I'm testing it continuously. As a matter of fact, I'm looking at a, a new thing that I probably shouldn't even be talking about, but I'm looking at it right now as we speak, and I'm going to be testing it here. I can't do it this week because I'm going to be gone, hopefully, if my damn plane doesn't get canceled tomorrow. But anyway, Thank you for listening to me babble for the last hour. There's my contact information. I apologize for that one slide. I just brought it in from another deck, had my voice in there, but basically showing that Russia has the bulk of their um, ground-based um, telemetry um, in the uh, former Soviet Union. The scary part is their interface with Brazil and the total of seven that they're going to have ground-based stations there. So Thank you very much. <laughs> That's awesome, Bob. <laughs> you can tell all of this was uh, developed by most militaries, right? Everything is an acronym. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> an acronym for everything under the sun. Um, there is one thing in the chat, and uh, Ryan, I'll get to that in a second, but I, I wanted to circle back. So the very first slide showed the the health or the uh, lifespan of the U.S. Geo, uh, GPS satellites, and it showed yep. basically seven and a half years but the last one died in 2019 or something like that. So it lasted yeah. close to 23 or, or 22 years or whatever. Um, what's kind of the, I guess, maybe just 30 second backstory on maybe lasting them that long or, and then what is some of the lifespans of these moving forward? I mean, I know you had them all on there, but it seems like we keep the dragon, dragging them out longer and longer and longer. So yeah, they are. And I'll bring up that in here so you can um, see. Um, and you can see the, um, you know, the, the block threes, they're looking at a 15 year. So we go from like a seven, seven and a half year with the, the, the two RMs and then into, I believe a 12 or 13, I think yeah, 12 year yeah. and then into a 15 year. So they're, the, the hardware is getting better and better, but you got to keep in mind, you know, the earth is orbiting right now on its axis at 1,030 miles per hour. We're in orbit around the sun at 67,000 miles per hour. We have satellites up in space that are in orbit at um, 8,700 miles per hour, broadcasting data at 186,000 miles per second that plow through the electromagnetically charged ionosphere and miraculously land at your GNSS receiver and you piss and because it took you more than 30 seconds to initialize. <laughs> so we're getting this technology that's up there and we're making it better and better, but we really don't want it too, 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 too long because it's going to continue and continue and continue to improve. Yeah. So that 15 year lifespan is probably going to be like more, more like 20 ish. Gotcha. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, scroll back down to the, the, uh, the Big Dipper, the Baidu. Um, the Baidu. Okay. The Baidu one. Yeah. You had, uh, and I just wanted to question the accuracy because the accuracy said three yeah that one right there it says 3.6 yeah. meters right well keep in mind Sounds our auton uh, on the gps side our autonomous positioning um is a, uh, with was enabled is a couple meters of the truth well not not nat a3 gps don't care about nat a3 right. don't get me going on that topic yeah yeah um, got it um but um, so a couple meters of the truth 
of, um, of, of global reference frames, and then two and a half times that vertically. So they're actually a little bit better than what we are uh, global accuracy autonomously. Um, you know, within reason, uh, probably just a little bit better, but you gotta keep in mind that a lot of these newer constellations, especially Galileo, um, they learn from our mistakes, right? We still have antiquation up in space. Um, we're slowly starting to transition it. But right now, quite honestly, the Chinese are ahead of us a little bit, except for the Block 3 satellites. Um, but they are because they've learned from us. They had three phases. They had those experimental phases where they fine-tuned their mission. And then again, the Europeans had those geo, the, uh, the uh, in-orbit validation. So they were studying for a long time. So, um, um, you know, we're right there in the mix. But once we get a full constellation of those block threes and three Fs, we'll be superior to all other constellations. Gotcha. That's awesome. Um, where could we find the web UIs? How do you find some of that? Oh, the web UI. Oh, excellent question. Um, it's on every, well, not every, anything R10 and above. Um, and the easiest way to do it is you can tap it, it, even if you don't, you can put a SIM card in your receiver, but you don't need to. All you have to do is with your cell phone, it'll show up as a Wi-Fi device. Um, and then you just go to the, um, the Wi-Fi device and then type in uh, 192.168.142.1. Um, and that will tap you into the web UI It'll ask you for a username and password. Um, the defaulted username is admin, all lowercase. And the password is password, all lowercase. And in newer receivers, you'll, they'll make you for security reasons, automatically uh, change that before you can move forward. But dude, you can do, you can send out a whole crew with a cell phone, if you were doing static surveying and they can start their base without any interface, uh, if, if, if you needed to go one direction, like for instance, I used to do a lot of work for the VOR and I'd set up on dams. Well, heck, it would take me 45 minutes to get up there. I could drop my crew off down below, start my base with my cell phone, boom, they're up and running while I'm spending another 45 minutes coming down the hill. So it, and it's all free. So it's there. That's awesome. And then uh, in the chat, um, Ryan was driving earlier, so he missed kind of the conversation part of it. But uh, can you please clarify why there are 34 satellites on the screen? But when I start my survey, I only end up with 15. So and you yes, did sit on exactly. it. He, yeah, he was missing. He missed that part. So, yeah. So you got 34 because you're tracking probably full GNSS. Um, um, and then you get a data packet come over from your base. So if your base or not so much your base, even the reference network that you're using, if you're using a VRN and it's GPS and GLONASS only, you're only as strong as the weak link and you're gonna drop down to that number. Um, also, even if you have full GNSS on both ends of the stick, you sometimes will still drop a satellite or two because of bandwidth, depending on how, you know, whether it's UHF or uh, cellular, you know, you might drop a satellite or two just because of the bandwidth. That's why Trimble went to what they call CMR X, X for compression instead of CMR plus. So it's more compressed to get more data over the air during that narrow banding initiative back in 2013. But that's the problem. You're only as strong as your correction source. And if your correction source is GPS and GLONASS only. You could be a happy camper out there with your 36 satellites, but as soon as that correction packet comes over from your base, you're gonna drop two satellites in common. There you go. Good to go there, Ryan. You got it that time? Thumbs up? Yeah, there you go, perfect. Anybody, um, anybody wanna have any more questions? Anybody wanna unmute themselves, ask a question or two? Maybe, maybe, maybe. I'm here. I know. It doesn't look like it. Are you? Uh, would you be willing to share your just a PDF version of your PowerPoint? I typically throw it in the Dropbox of that. Yeah, of, uh, I can me. do that. Okay. Um, Sweet. I'll have to take out the video thing and a couple, make some minor edits, but I'd be more than happy to 
okay. to share it. Um, it's all open information, like I say. Yeah, exactly. um, perfect. You just have to, sometimes it's not easy to find some of this stuff. You have to right. dig and dig. That's why putting this together kind of simplifies it. We kind of covered in an hour what took me some in cases weeks to kind of right. put together. But yeah, exactly. um, um, I hope it was worth your while. Yeah, no, that was great. Uh, George, George threw his hand up there. So go for it, George. Okay, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully I'm unmuted. Yep, uh, Robert, just wanted to say thanks for uh, helping me learn a little bit more about this technology. I'm pretty much an old school guy. I've been licensed for over 40 years and I can do a lot with a total station. I can do a lot with an old T1 or a T16, but this <laughs> stuff is smoke and mirrors and magic. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Exactly. Uh, you know, I understand. I, I understand how it works, but but this this kind of uh, access to information really helps me understand the big picture. And you know, I'm not. I'm probably not going to be taking advantage of this technology anytime soon. <laughs> no, you I'm, said you're retiring after this. Yeah, I'm trying for the second time. I failed the first time. Uh, uh, but I, I I do feel your I pain. Really, I really appreciate the knowledge because it keeps my brain spinning and it gives me a reason to get up in the morning and wonder about life. <laughs> well, I feel your pain because I started with a plane table and alligate, yeah. a Philly rod and a chain. Um, I had a, a actually a, uh, an 1800s uh, style uh, K and E transit where the focus was external, so you had to apply a stadia coefficient. Yep. So I feel your pain. So I've had to go from that to this. But fortunately, the first company I was working for, the BSC Group, um, um, Fritz Peterson and Gunter Grulick. Fritz was Rommel's surveyor over in Africa during World War II. And long story short. Um, um, he was very innovative in thinking and got involved in GPS in the very early days. So I had to make that transition. So um, I do feel your pain. Well, you know, I, lot, I, I, a lot, I a lot of those. Go for it, George. I can tell you that I, I set some monumentation at Stead Airport here in Reno back in the 70s, the middle 70s, uh, a horizontal location and a vertical elevation for Bill Lear, who was developing a uh, GPS system for flying planes, uh, not not eight track cassette players, but he did those too. Uh, but at any rate, uh, I had no idea what the monuments were going to be used for, but evidently they were used for uh, airplanes. He'd drive out and park this plane over this monument, take a reading, and off he'd go, and it could fly automatically to Las Vegas. That's awesome. <laughs> I was joking. I was going to say uh, a few of those items you guys just talked about sold pretty well at the scholarship auction at the uh, live auction. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm amazed at the number of people that don't know what a linker rod is or how to use it. <laughs> well, they were great because it saved math in the fields, right? Because you were reading your elevation directly. Most people on here wouldn't know what we're talking about, but um, yeah. um, I used to like the Allidade because I had a quarter stadia hair. And, um, um, but uh, but it was kind of fun to go from there. But you know what, sir, it, if you know the fundamentals of measurement, you can apply those exact fundamentals to what I just went through. You just got to do your own testing, get that warm, fuzzy feeling. But you can apply that same good field uh, methodology with older traditional instrumentation to GNSS technology. Um, um, it's just a matter of training. Well, and, and it seems to me like the key is you need, you you kind of need to understand what the answer needs to be before you before you solve for it, because if you don't know what the answer is, you don't if you can't expect what it's going to be, you can't expect it to be. You're not going to know if it's wrong. Well, I always tell people, you know, I'm I'm from Alba, the Albuquerque area, and I call them drive-by shootings. Uh, when people hop out of their vehicle, they get their first up and just measure the point, you know, and um, there's two different types of answers you can get with your equipment. Uh, GNSS, you get the right answer, and you can get the wrong answer. So you're 100% correct. Um, but over time in practice, with good field um, practice, you can build up a pretty warm, a good feeling that your data is um, good. Well, I think, I think that's the case with all surveying is, is setting up good procedures, and practices and then making sure they get employed. 
Uh, if, you if you do that, you can you can trust what you're what what the data you get is. Exactly. Well, it looks like uh, there's no other questions, but uh, a couple of great uh, thank yous in the in the chat. And if you follow along there, but great presentation. Thanks for a great summary. You were right about making complex things a little simpler. So. <laughs> Well, stuff. you're welcome. Yeah. If you'd like to have me back sometime, just let me know. Oh, heck yeah. Yeah, no, we'll. Alrighty. We'll, uh, I appreciate it, Bob. Everybody have a good uh -huh. night. Have a good week, you're guys. Welcome. Yep. Great. Thanks. Bye,